Good morning. My name is Dave Dulio, and I'm the director of the Center for Civic Engagement at Oakland University. And I'm pleased to welcome you to Defy the Divide, a Path to Civility. Thank you again for being here. We're also very grateful that our guests have taken time out of their busy schedules to be part of this important discussion. This event would not be possible without the help of a number of people. Thanks to those who helped make it happen. At the top of this list is OU President Ora Hirsch Peskovitz. The Center for Civic Engagement has no bigger supporter on campus. In addition, the Office of Government and Community Relations, University Communications and Marketing, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Event Support Services were great partners in planning this event. Few other times in our nation's history has there been as pressing a need for public discussion about civility and respect in our national discourse as there is today. Oakland University is poised to be a leader in the effort to bring about a better public dialogue. In fact, the Center for Civic Engagement was started in part to address the rancor that permeates today's political and civic life. To support and foster a more civil and informative public dialogue about some of the fundamental issues dividing Americans, the Center for Civic Engagement is launching a series of timely discussions we are calling Toward a More Perfect Union. This is the first session in that series. Now on to our panel. I'll keep this very brief as our guests are very well known. We're delighted to welcome three of Michigan's US representatives. Alyssa Slotkin, who represents a portion of OU's campus, in addition to communities stretching from Rochester to Lansing. Debbie Dingle, who represents portions of Wayne and Washtenaw counties. And Fred Upton, who represents communities in Allegan, Berrien, Cass, Kalamazoo, St. Joseph, and Van Buren counties. All are members of the U.S. House's Problem Solvers Caucus. The caucus's website states, quote, only when we work together as Americans can we successfully break through the gridlock of today's politics. More about the caucus will certainly come up in the discussion, but I'll note that Michigan is fortunate to have five members of this group, more than any other state. We're pleased that we could get three of these members' schedules to align and for them to be here today. Guiding the conversation over the next hour or so will be two others who need no introduction as they are two of our state's preeminent journalists. Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson. We turned to them for moderators for a different reason, however. Their work in starting the Civility Project, which I'm sure they'll bring up during the conversation, is much needed as part of the effort to bring about a better public dialogue. As we do at all of our events at the Center for Civic Engagement, I'd like to mention our tenets of civic engagement and productive dialogue. These are simply guideposts as as to how we want conversations to happen uh, when we do have them. We want to engage in respectful dialogue. We want to employ honest listening, model civil behavior and tone, support free and open discourse, consider viewpoints other than our own, and find opportunities to agree, not just agree, not just disagree. So with that, I'll turn it over to Nolan and Stephen. Thank you again for being here, and we look forward to the conversation. Well, thank you, David, and uh, thanks to Oakland University for hosting this today. Very important subject and a, a very uh, welcome addition, this, this whole uh, civic engagement project you all have, uh, have going on there. Uh, couldn't be a better time for it, and we appreciate Oakland University's efforts uh, in, in this regard. And thanks to our, uh, our Congress members for joining us today. Uh, why don't we start out by uh, talking about the Problem Solvers Caucus, what, uh, what you all hope to accomplish with it, what you have accomplished, and uh, you know, what are the prospects that we, will, that we will reach a point where we can govern together in Washington? Fred, you're good at it. Well, you go first. <laughs> all right, well, first of all, pleasure to be here. All, all three of us are happy to be here. That is for sure. It's a very important topic. Problem Solvers Caucus actually started a couple of years ago, uh, maybe three Congresses ago. I was not a founding member, I'll confess, but I've been very active the last couple of years and last Congress and certainly in this one. A uh, couple of things we've accomplished uh, right away. First of all, we actually changed the rules of the House to create more bipartisanship. 
Uh, and I give the Democrats credit. This all happened under Nancy Pelosi's watch. And it was this caucus, particularly the Democrats in this caucus, who insisted for their vote uh, for a speaker that, in fact, the rules change. And I will say that had the Republicans won the majority back in 2018, we had a number of us Republicans that would have insisted on the same changes then with uh, speak that would have been Speaker Kevin McCarthy. So that was a that was a big change. Uh, the other thing, a couple of things that we've done, we have an, abs an absolute civility pledge that all of us uh, take. This is a caucus with an equal number of Republicans and Democrats. We actually grew uh, by I don't know six or eight members in, in this Congress as well. And we've been very active in pursuing a number of what I would call common sense legislative solutions uh, on important national issues. Alyssa and I went down to the Texas border uh, two years ago. It was, it was a crisis then, as I would confess, it's a crisis now, but it was particularly alarming and with all these kids that were coming in and resources that were strapped so that our our law enforcement folks at the border didn't have the, the means to take care of this. It was our group that forced the legislation through. Immigration is a big issue. and We've passed actually what I would call two pretty big important immigration measures just in the last couple of weeks. One dealing with agriculture with more than 300 ag groups uh, supporting it, as well as the dreamers, uh, things that got stuck. To me, this ought to be the low hanging fruit. We need comprehensive immigration reform. But we took these on as issues. And last thing, because I don't want to dominate the time, we meet, uh, before COVID, we met at least once a week for an hour. Everyone left their labels at the door. Uh, there was no leaks. There was absolute uh, uh, work together. No one really pointed fingers at each other. We've taken a pledge not to ever campaign against each other. So you really build that trust, which is important. And now, because of COVID, really for a year, we've been operating out of our homes. <laughs> I know Debbie's home, Alyssa, this is my house is my side porch. But we actually are in touch with each other on Zoom probably a couple times a week for a couple hours, actually. In fact, already this morning, uh, I've talked to our two leaders, Josh Gottheimer in New Jersey and Tom Reed, a Republican lead in New York State. We're working on a couple different issues, and it is you know, with divided government, the only way you're going to get things done is to work together, to have trust with each other, to have common sense, and try to move the ball forward. And that's what this caucus is dedicated to. So, and I'd like to build on what Fred said, which, uh, and to talk about why personal relationships matter. You know, it, there was a time when people got to know each other. They worked together, their kids went, kids went to school together. They didn't go home every weekend. And by the way, I think people should be going home every weekend. So, but that adjustment of, you know, as airplane travel has become easier and regular, although we're all a little afraid of it these days in COVID. Um, people would have dinners, they'd have potluck dinners. People got to know each other. Uh, and everybody knows I was married to John Dingle. He played paddle ball every week with George Bush and Don Rumsfeld. They were the best of friends for decades. And people don't get develop those kind of relationships every, anymore. And relationship building is critical to trusting each other. It's critical to work. Now, I talk to Fred almost every day. And the days that I don't talk to him when I go to bed, I'm like, I haven't talked to Fred today. We I've already did talk this morning. We did talk this morning <laughs> before nine o'clock. We do, we're not afraid to... I talked to Haley, who's another member of Problem Solvers at 6.45 a.m. We, we'll call each other early too. Um, uh, but I'm very clear, every person in the Democratic Party knew Fred Upton's my, one of my closest friends and I would not campaign against him. Nor quite frankly, uh, I had known Peter Meyer and uh, Hank, his father has been my friend for decades. I serve on the Gerald Ford Library with him in the Gerald Ford School. And I would not campaign against Peter because, and uh, Alyssa knows, I told people, this is a friend. I think that those personal relationships matter and civility matters and you've got to build that trust. And that's one of the keys to problem solvers, getting to know each other. And I would just add from a from a perspective of someone who's only in their second term, right? Uh, you know, when I got elected in 2018, um, from a district that, you know, voted for Donald Trump and is Republican, um, uh, it, 
you w- show up at Congress, you know, in orientation and you say, how do I find my people? You know, who am I going to connect with to get to know, to really invest time in? And I, I took it as a mandate um, from my district and based on my national security background to find the people who really wanted to do that tough kind of nug work of bipartisanship. And so the problem solvers is literally the first group um, and frankly, really the only group that I found that was A, organized, equal numbers of Democrats and Republicans, met every week, actually worked on legislation, didn't leak on each other, and um, and use somehow the press against each other. Um, and at the end of the day, um, you realize, you know, you, you have a cadre of people on both sides of the aisle who know that we don't agree on everything. And certainly we've had tough moments in, in the past year um, on you know, uh, how that have strained um, any relationship, but because we have worked on things together, you know, because we worked on a COVID bill in November and December, when we had really tough things happen in January, we could have the tough conversation and they were tough, but still come out of it as colleagues ready to work together. And I just haven't found another group like that as a, a relatively new member of Congress. So it's it's been pretty important and pretty formative for me. So the, the problem I think uh, that, that each of you faces um, uh, is within your own party, uh, which is kind of different, right? I mean, normally we talk about politicians having to, to contend with uh, their political opposites. Um, but for instance, Fred, uh, Ron Weiser, who's the, the chair of the GOP uh, here in the state of Michigan says, you are the problem uh, in the Republican party uh, in Michigan. Uh, And Debbie and Alyssa, you know, the far left uh, uh, representatives in in Congress, uh, in the Democratic party would say that the kind of compromises you're making uh, distract from, you know, the agenda that, that, that uh, the party has and, and, and should have. And so I think when people look at something like a problem solvers caucus, the, the, the natural question is, well, how far can this really go? Uh, how much can you really accomplish? Because at some point your own party uh, is gonna, you know, yank your chain and say, either you get in line or, you know, maybe we primary you or, May we ostracize you in, inside Congress. So I wonder if each of you can talk about how those kinds of negotiations take place, not among you guys, but between you guys uh, and the extremes of your own parties. Well, let me just say a couple of things. First of all, no election is easy for anybody, unless you're unopposed, and that's never happened to anybody. <laughs> uh, so I've been in Congress uh, the longest, uh, and you know, I've had seven primaries and we've done pretty well in every, oh, we, we won every time. You know, I had a primary in 18, I had a, a primary in 20, I ran against state reps, state senators, you know, because of term limits, the things sort of go around a little bit faster than, than maybe they, they would have. Uh, but at the end of the day, in, in my districts, a swing district, very much like Alyssa's, I think. Uh, remember, I'm a Wolverine, not a Spartan, so I don't go there all that often. <laughs> Stole that clock way back when, um, uh, but it's um, you know those, those things happen, and we've done pretty well. And you know you, you win by addition, not not by subtraction. And if people want a rubber stamp, they got the wrong guy. All right, uh, and you know in my district, quite frankly, with rare exception over the last hundred years, it's gone for the winner of the presidential race. Uh, the way that it's configured today in virtually every election. Obama won my district and I won it too. Yeah, you know, even though I was a national guy for McCain, I was one of his national chairs, um, he, um, he <laughs> didn't win. Uh, <laughs> Romney uh, didn't win, uh, you know. Uh, so in those, those things happen. And, it, but I have found that you know, I ran for Congress to make a difference. Uh, this was never a lifelong dream that I had. Uh, they had a lot of successes, uh, that is for sure. People don't, the voters, don't really care for the most part. If you have an R or a D next to your name, they want the job done. They want you to listen. They want you to work. We have divided government. This is, this is the time. And that's what I stand for. 
And you look just to close this last election, Trump narrowly won my district. I, I won it by 16 points. Um, proof is in the pudding. And I would just add to that as someone, you know, I'm the, the only Democrat in Congress who represents a district that voted for Romney, then Trump, then Trump again, right? So, uh, you know, I represent a lot of independently minded voters and that's good because I'm an independently minded person. And of course there's pressure. I, I You feel it every single day, um, but you just make sure people understand. I don't vote because someone tells me to vote a certain way. You read the bills, you actually learn about what you're voting on um, and you, you're accountable to the people that elected you, not your national leadership. And while I'm respectful to, to all of my colleagues and I'm willing to talk to anybody, anybody, if they have a good idea, um, I, I think if you have your bearings and you understand, as Fred said, that you're not here to just fill a seat, you're here to actually get something done. And that if I don't get reelected, nobody dies. Nobody dies, right? I would like to be reelected, but it's I'm not going to compromise my integrity or what I believe just to keep the seat. So uh, I think once you get comfortable with that, and I certainly got comfortable with that in my in my first term at Oakland University, you know, taking a ton of of hits for decisions that I made. Um, you know, once you're okay with that, and you realize that your job is responsible to the people who elected you, it's a much easier job uh, voting as you see fit. So I would tell you that I actually probably have one of the most diverse districts in the state where you can just take a line right through it. I have Ann Arbor uh, and the progressives and I have the down rivers, which are strong, many Trump supporters and I represent Dearborn, which um, it, it has, um, I'm very proud to represent the Arab Americans in the Congress too. But last year, I, I did have um, a, a significant challenger in the primary, though I took it very seriously. And first, they were upset with me because I did not come out for impeachment immediately because I don't take the cause of the day. Uh, when you take a position, you've got to have the facts and there's got to be a reason. And when you have an election, you respect the results of the election. And that person is president of all of us, whether you think they're doing a good job or not. So that, and then I did not last time uh, support the Green New Deal because I'm very worried about jobs. And I had for two years, every place I went, I had protesters. If I gave a speech, they would go up on the stage. If I was at the farmer's market, Fred would hear me call and give them the, but I wasn't afraid to talk to them. I mean, I had sittings in my offices, but I talked to them and I told them how I felt. And this year I have been very serious about bringing the two sides together, just as in problem solvers, how we talk to each other. I have spent the last month bringing labor and the presidents of every national environmental group together. And labor has been very clear talking about their concerns about their jobs and the environmentalists are telling people what they think and I'm trying to find that common ground. And that's some, I got elected as these two did and everybody else did to solve problems. And I'm trying to solve problems. Um, not, uh, it, you know, you might think an election is a popularity contest, but the fact of the matter is, I think people are tired of partisan bickering. Although uh, there's more of it than I've certainly seen in my lifetime. They want to see us get things done. And there are a lot of problems in this country that we need to work together to get solved. How far will congressional leadership let you go on this? At what point do they sort of jerk back and say, you've got to fall in line with the partisan caucuses? And are there any members of, of, of leadership in the caucus? Are there any committee chairs uh, as part of your group? Well, um, in terms of pressure from the party leaders, uh, remember we're in the minority, so if the, if the deep are all together, it doesn't really matter uh, because they have the votes to, to get something done. But, uh, you know, hey, uh, I, I was once the, a, the deputy whip, a deputy whip uh, under Newt Gingrich. And, um, you know, I, I, I left that in the, in the 90s. Uh, I got on Energy and Commerce, best committee that there is, is Debbie would uh, Agree. Uh, Alyssa might have a little concern, but I'm sure we we'd we'd like to have her, and she'd like to come come over there if she had a choice. But 
you know, when I got an energy and commerce committee and there was a little grumbling, maybe uh, I said, look, uh, my vote's not, you know, I, I'm not a rubber stamp. I, I, I'm where I want to be. And if some people are complaining about my votes, uh, I don't need to do this. I'm going to be energy and commerce. And of course, I became chairman uh, of the committee for six years. We have we have term limits. But I, I have to say, there's no, is at least on our WIP team, uh, there's really not necessarily the pressure knowing that we're in the minority. Uh, 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 there's not any real breaking of arms, as some might say, um, uh, to get votes, uh, especially on votes of conscience uh, that we have. And usually there's, there's a number of us that are together. Uh, there's not a lot of votes that are pure party line, uh, that's for sure. Uh, as it relates to uh, chairman, we have some, we have people on every committee. Uh, and of course, under the committee rules, uh, any, uh, any amendments that's germane is, is open. Uh, that's the, the case in the Energy and Commerce Committee. When I was chairman, I changed the rules. It, it stayed the same now. Frank Pallone, who's the chairman, we have bipartisan amendments go first. They go ahead of the queue uh, over to encourage people to work with both sides of the aisle. Um, we have, you know, we have people on ways and means, on appropriations. Uh, we have senior members uh, that are either chair or rank members uh, on, on subcommittees there. So it's a very good group of what I would call influential members on both sides of the aisle. Different ages, different classes, different areas of the country were all represented. So I would, I'm actually a member of leadership. I'm uh, one of the co-chairs of the Democratic Policy and Communications Committee and on the WIP team as well. And I would tell you that I have a reputation for saying exactly what I think and what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. Doesn't mean my head's not decapitated at least once a week, but I'll never not be the person. I am who I am. I, I say what I think, and I think there needs to be more people that tell people what they think. Yeah, and if I might reclaim my time just for two seconds, one of the things that our leadership does, we're at the table. Uh, they, ha they have us at the table. Uh, we're able to weigh in. They know where we are. It's li I like to say it's no surprise. It's sort of like the old Holiday Inn commercial. Uh, th there's not a lot of surprise. We let them know where we are because we feel like if we're part of the, the takeoff, we're part of the land. And I would just say, I mean, I, you know, I, I um, have not voted for Speaker Pelosi in the last, uh, you know, in the two terms that I've been, um, had that option to vote for her. And I uh, will express to you that there's a lot of pressure um, when that vote comes up. And you, again, you just have to decide, like, how vulnerable are you to that pressure? What's going to move you? And, um, you know, if you stick to your guns and you have a little bit of a spine, then it, the pressure, you're polite, you always engage with people, but it doesn't move you. And I think, um, I think that um, uh, despite those decisions where I've split from my party, I'm still the chairwoman of a, a subcommittee on Homeland Security. I run a task force on supply chains and has like things that have depended on leadership's approval have come through for me. So um, I think um, the other thing I would just say is, let's be honest, the Democrats have a micro thin majority in certainly the Senate, but also the House. So if four of us in the House, four Democrats decide not to vote for something, a bill can't pass if it's gonna be on a party line vote. So I have found actually in the second term compared to the first term that I have a lot more communication with leadership. They are coming to talk to us, um, particularly those of us in you know, Republican leaning districts to say, where are you on this? What do you think about this? What do you need in order to get there? And that discussion, I will tell you, I feel like is healthy. So, so I think if you look at a lot of the success you guys have had, um, you know, it's, it's on subjects that are uh, somewhat distant from the hottest and most contentious uh, issues uh, in, in Washington. And, and, and so I think there's kind of a natural question, which is, okay, so something like the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative Act is a, is a really great opportunity for people to work across the aisle. Uh, everybody from you know, a Great Lakes state should be for that, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. Uh, but, but how do you build from there to be able to say, okay, well, healthcare is also an issue that, uh, that, that, that Republicans and Democrats ought to, ought to 
see more common ground on. Immigration uh, is something that uh, Republicans and, and Democrats ought to be able to, to, to compromise on. I mean, are we closer to that kind of cooperation on those kinds of issues because of the work that you're doing? I'm just gonna push back a little bit on your premise. Okay. Um, only because um, the, literally the COVID bill that President Trump signed in December would not have existed had it not been for the Problem Solvers Caucus, yeah, who right. literally saw our collective leadership um, so dug in that they couldn't compromise. Um, we worked first, we tried to do it in August. Um, people did Zoom calls, Fred was a real leader on this, Zoom calls to try and come up with that compromise package. We got so close to the election that it, it couldn't work, but literally over Thanksgiving, um, while people are with their families, Zoom calls, Democrats and Republicans coming up with a compromise and really literally forcing it upon um, leadership, meaning taking it to the White House and saying, if we, you know, if we can agree on this, can you agree on this? Can we bring it back and get congressional leadership? So unemployment checks, stimulus checks, help for our businesses would not have happened. I, don't, I call that relevant. Yeah, <laughs> I'll no, claim no, that I, is relevant. Yeah. Um, and then similarly, literally some of the only bipartisan legislation on immigration has come out of this caucus. Um, Fred's bill on farm workers. And it, it may not be solving in a comprehensive way. And Lord knows that's the great white whale that we all have to be committed to doing. Um, but you know, when you can't hit home runs, it doesn't mean you can't hit singles. Um, and uh, we've got a lot of folks in Washington who think on both sides of the aisle, if it's not a home run, I'm not touching it. And I reject that as someone who believes in getting something done. But I think we have been more relevant than maybe you're giving us credit for. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's absolutely fair. Uh, and, Fred and Debbie. And, and, and remember, Trump almost vetoed that last COVID bill. I mean, this yeah, was worked so hard. And it was it was the lifeline. I mean, Michigan, our small businesses. I mean, we had to have it. And you know, we started this in March. Actually, it was the first bill passed. Even even little little dig here at our former colleague Amash. I think even Amash voted for the first bill. Uh, <laughs> I think it was four seventeen to one. I think it was Tom Massey that voted against it. But but you know, it was a Herculean effort to get it. And then I can remember we got the word that Trump was thinking about vetoing it because it wasn't quote perfect. Well. Tell me what perfect is, but oh, we all just about died. We all called the White House. Ultimately, we got him to sign the bill. Thank goodness uh, that it got done. But you know, Alyssa was right up. But there's a lot of issues that we're working on. Uh, you, you know, you, you talk. And it goes back to maybe what I did. Debbie was a, a part of this. Alyssa wasn't there when we got 21st Century Cures done. We passed that bill 392 to 26 in the House. Uh, this would provided the funding to actually speed up the approval of drugs and devices, we wouldn't still have a vaccine approved today without that bill that Obama signed into law. Biden was a big help on it. We're already working on a 2.0 bill. Uh, and again, building on those relationships to try to get something done and ferret it through the, all the hoops and, and uh, wickets uh, between the House and the Senate uh, as well. You know, when you, I mean, I. I, I work with Fred and Alyssa, but Fred and I just were on the same committee. So, but water as a human right, addressing the lead issue uh, in Flint. So Fred was critical to getting, when it was a Republican co uh, Congress and a Republican speaker to getting the aid to Flint. He's now working with Rashida and I on water is, uh, you know, right now, making sure water is not shut out. He and I this morning were, he called me several weeks ago about the Asian American hatred that was out there and what could we do about it as a Congress? And he told me that I needed to suggest something to Grace Mang and I said, will you co-sponsor it? And he said, yes. So I called Grace and we worked on that. This morning, we were talking about election uh, laws. We're, we deal with the auto issues, which quite frankly, to this state is one of the most critical issues there are. And these are the hardest and the toughest and the ugliest. And I have bruises on my body now. Fred and I talk about them every single day right now. I'm the one in the ring that's got the bruises. But he also, his wisdom gives me, you know, it, it's a lot of 
So I actually think all three of us are working together. Infrastructure, I, you know, I'm on the problem solvers infrastructure task force broadband. Fred's the coach, uh, the co-lead with Jim Clyburn on broadband for both urban and rural areas. Those are all really important issues, Steve. So I would say to you, you're not, there are a lot of things we're all trying to find that common ground on, unity. One of the things- I could was, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the object of the civility project, which Steve and I are involved in and, and started is to get people to talk across their differences in a productive manner. It's, get them to stop shouting at each other. And we have a question from our from a, a member of our audience who wanted to know what role you all can play beyond Congress in getting people to work together and talk together and uh, stop hating one another so much. I mean, we assume most of America lives in the middle politically, and yet we are sh we, we have the fringes of these two parties and the extremes of these two parties, you know, pulling the country back and forth and screaming at each other. How can you take this beyond uh, the halls of Congress and, and get the American people as a whole to tone down a little bit, to cool down a little? Well, we have to go on the road. Uh, and I gotta tell you, you know, as you know, Debbie and I wrote Economic Club uh, together a, a year and a half ago. Uh, we did the Gerald Ford Policy School in Ann Arbor uh, together. She came over to my district. It actually went not only to my district, but Peter Myers in, in Grand Rapids. They hosted a, a wonderful forum there uh, last year. Uh, I've been, I'm, I'm scheduled to do one with Diana DeGette, who is my partner on 21st Century Cures in Denver uh, with another great university like, like Oakland uh, there uh, this next month. Um, you know, uh, Alyssa and I, we, we've done a, a number of these uh, things. Uh, and, you know, frankly, we, we have to rely on the media, Nolan. That's you, to that other hat that you wear. And, and I got to say that as I look at a lot of our Michigan pundits on media, I look at Michael Patrick Shield, I look at you, I look at others. Um, this is something that people are yearning for, and they need to see us do it uh, in reality. I mean, uh, the awful thing that happened in Oakland County uh, a couple of two, couple weeks, two weeks ago now, it seems like a month ago, uh, you know, with uh, the Oakland County Republican Party. I mean, they, it got shot down pretty fast. And uh, Ron Weiser, I, I know, is more than chagrin in, in terms of uh, what, what he said that day. And obviously the, the censure that came from the regents on Friday. So we need to move on uh, and we, we need to, to, to focus on folks that really want to work together, which is something that all, certainly all three of us, but really the problem solvers call it, that's an underlying theme of who we are. And I would, go ahead, Lisa. I would just add that I think in addition to actually providing examples of how Democrats and Republicans can and should talk to each other, right, in forums like this and, and all the, those that Fred mentioned, I actually think that in 2021, given the state of the country, it's our responsibilities to be leaders within our own districts to bring together groups that wouldn't otherwise be in the same room. Um, this to me was really brought home, frankly, um, after uh, the murder of George Floyd, where we had, I had different groups talking to me, but they weren't talking to each other. And so we literally, because Zoom makes it a whole lot easier, we started bringing those communities together. I've done actual tra training on you know, conflict resolution because there are such disparate voices in my district. And I think by COVID has actually given, certainly me an opportunity to really get to know a bunch of local leaders across the political spectrum so that we've built up some trust so that they're, they're willing to come together and have some tough conversations. That is an absolute requirement for certainly in, in my district in the middle of the state here in mid Michigan, because um, people are, are starting to lose their empathy for other people, right? There's not enough connective tissue and they don't feel empathy for others who have different views and that goes nowhere good. So in addition to serving as an example, I think literally facilitating and using your convening power as an elected official to bring together different groups. And so, I, go ahead, Debbie, and then I got one thing to add. You can add, I'm respectful. 
So take the issue of the day right now. What's on CNN right now? The trial in Minneapolis. Our caucus, uh, a number of us, outside of the press's eye, I would say in the last three weeks, there have been about a dozen of us that have spent at least 10 to 12 hours listening to experts around the country, trying to find the right spot so that we really get police reform in a place that most of America will accept. Uh, they've all been behind the scenes. Not a thing is leaked and it's not gonna leak now, but we're working with a Congressional Black Caucus. We're working with the senators. We're working with the White House. We're working with Republicans and Democrats. And hopefully in the next uh, week or two, uh, we're gonna have something that's, that's ready to go that moves the ball forward that really has bipartisan support. You know, and on that, well, first of all, I want to say God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. We need to listen more and talk less. We do lead by leading. I've done uh, much of what Alyssa has said. I've been doing my whole life, quite frankly, of bringing um, disparate groups together. But as Fred talks about this, we have to be willing to have uncomfortable conversations because the fact of the matter is we saw another law enforcement officer die last Friday at the Capitol. The Capitol Police on, at the insurrection um, uh, on the 6th kept us safe. But there are law enforcement that uh, do think, I mean, we also all saw George Floyd on that video and what happened to him. There's a court trial, so I won't give an opinion here right now. But we really need to have some uncomfortable conversations. And there are some real issues and we gotta find a way to have those conversations in civil, respectful ways. I talk about it on my Facebook page almost every day. Somehow I started doing a daily blog and um, so did Fred. Uh, it's been uh, since the big pandemic and today was day 385. So it's been a lot of writings, but we need to like bring people, you gotta talk it, you gotta walk the talk. And we gotta not be afraid to have uncomfortable conversations. And we all are, and you all have the ability to do that. Um, but we all need to respect each other more. I use the word empathy, compassion, kindness. They matter in this day and age. And I think COVID brings us to, has shined a light on that. You know, Congress is as evenly divided as we've seen it in a long, long time. The Democratic majorities are very, very narrow. It reflects the, the division in the country, which is you know about half of the people on one side of the aisle, half the people on the other. Wouldn't that be a uh, very powerful argument for bipartisan governing mm -hmm. and for not shoving things through on narrow partisan votes? Well, that's why we changed the rules of the House. Uh, we actually now encourage more bipartisanship. And now that we've we've actually passed this April 1st deadline. So what was important about that? Well, in the rules package, again, this is a little bit inside baseball. In the rules package we passed the first day that uh, Pelosi was reelected as speaker in January, she passed the rules package that allowed her to bring up every bill that passed in the last Congress without going through committee. Now think about the committee process. That's where, again, any amendments, whether it's armed services or energy and commerce or appropriation, every committee can offer amendments. The, the ratio is generally somewhat pretty reflective of, of the body of the House. But she was able to bring up bills that passed with her larger majority in the last Congress and close the door on amendments. So a lot of these bills that we took up, no amendments were allowed, which was something that our side really objected to. But she narrowly got those votes uh, to get done. But that's now over. Uh, that was only effective through April 1st. So now from this point on, and maybe there was talk in her leadership, I'm just surmising here to, to maybe extend that because it worked out so well from their perspective. But again, it was the problem solvers. It was the Democrats and the problem solvers that said, you know what, this isn't fair. It needs to expire and it's not gonna get renewed. So now when we come in back into session next week, all of these bills have gone through committee. Uh, they're gonna go through the normal, what we call regular order and you're not going to be able to bring something up from the last Congress immediately to the floor uh, without that normal debate and amendments and I'll call it massaging 
that you might get in the ways and means or energy and commerce or, or uh, armed services uh, to, make, to get done. So hopefully now it'll really, stuff will really, ref to get stuff done, it'll really reflect, a, I hope, a bipartisan consensus of actually trying to improve these bills and get something ultimately to the president that he can sign that are bipartisan. Well, to that same point, what would, we've heard talk about uh, in the Senate about getting rid of the filibuster and going to a, a straight majority vote on, on bills, getting rid of that 60 vote requirement on most measures. What would that do to the tone of Congress and to the cause of bipartisan governing? Well, Mitch McConnell has already told you what he will do. He calls it the nuclear winter which by the way, quite frankly, we're, I, I, I have a problem with this. Uh, Fred knows how I feel, so it was Alyssa. We have a couple of Republican colleagues who the minute we come in, immediately require a vote to adjourn. And right now votes in the house are taking 45 minutes to an hour per vote and we're into midnight and people are stressed and grumpy and in bad moods and it does not create an environment um, that, uh, it, it uh, helps people come together or makes people like each other. Toxic. And toxic. toxic is a very good word for it. And Mitch McConnell has already said what he will do. But the fact of the matter is that we can't get bills through in the Senate either. It's a very complicated situation. But I'm going to quote John Dingle. John Dingle said we should eliminate the Senate. And I might be at a point I agree with him. <laughs> I'm just quoting John Dingle. I think you, you want six year terms in the house too. <laughs> <laughs> I like the two years. Fred, so what would that... getting rid of the filibuster do um, to, to the ability of Congress uh, to work together in, on any level? Well, a couple things. And I, you know, I, um, I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure that I have the answer being in, in the house. I would like to, and I'm not sure that it's going to happen because Joe Manchin is, is one Democrat that said he's going to, he, he would not vote to eliminate it. They have the uh, ability to do it. And it, it does change things from what's happened over the last 50 or 60 years. I'd like to think that they ought to get the signal that they ought to work together. Um, and maybe, and, and I don't know, I don't know that I come down on one side or the other that if they got rid of it, would that then encourage, well, this bill's gonna pass. So therefore let's work together on both sides of the aisle to actually improve it to have Republicans. You know, that's that's one thing that, that might happen versus no, you know, screw you and everyone that looks like you, um, you're, you're in the minority, we're not gonna allow anything to happen. I'd like to think that it would be the first one that the thought that would actually prevail to try and get something done. I mean, we. You know, our government is made up of checks and balances, three branches of government. I mean, uh, all of that. I'd, I'd like to think that, you know, we put the country first, uh, but I, 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 I can't, if they went through a real short shirt policy, and I got to tell you, we got some folks in our Freedom Caucus who just love it right now. Votes to adjourn every day, uh, votes on things that you never even heard about back in, in uh, college poli sci previous question votes, votes to reconsider. It, it is like a day that we might be done by 4.30 or 5 normally is taking us till 9, 10, even 11 o'clock at night. And I sure hope it's get better when we come back next week. You know, I, I actually think it's very clear what will happen in the Senate. I'm not as optimistic as Fred is. I think I, what, way or <laughs> what <laughs> really depresses me is the number. I have a lot of friends that are in the Senate, Republicans and Democrats. Uh, we all share them, but a lot of good pe people who are willing to sit at a table and talk to each other are leaving. Roy Blunt is leaving the Senate because he talks about how toxic it's become and Rob how, Portman. what, and Rob Portman was the next person, both of them, but there are a number of other senators that are willing to sit down. And by the way, I can remember when House and Senate talked to each other. And they talked about policy issues. They had real discussions about how to solve problems. It is very rare that the House and Senate even talk to each other at a member to member level. We need to find a way to get back to that. 
Uh, and I, you know, I keep trying to do that, but I am very worried about what's going to happen in the 2022 elections. And I would say to the American people, we don't have a Senate seat up in Michigan, but you need to really be aware of who you are electing in the 2022 election. And if you want to see more unity, if you want to see respect and civility and empathy for each other, then you need to demand that of the people that you elect to the Congress, no matter what their party. We've got a couple of questions from the audience about um, disinformation and misinformation, which of course is a big part of uh, political discourse uh, right now. I mean, there are people who, who really work very hard at, at making sure people have the wrong idea in their head. And, and um, I think we saw on January 6th, for instance, uh, you know, the extreme consequence uh, of that kind of, that kind of activity. I, I, I do wonder what effect that misinformation, that disinformation, the, 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 the manipulation of facts has on the conversations that you have within the Problem Solvers Caucus. I mean, uh, being able to settle on truth seems pretty, pretty key uh, to your work. Uh, does this this kind of noise from outside, which has such an effect on on voters, uh, have an effect on your your discussions as well? Uh, I would say. I mean, I think the majority of our membership um, are fact based folks who who. Um, you know, uh, we may have difference of uh, major differences of opinions on what to do about those facts, but there is still a conversation based around facts. And we have um, presentations and really wonderful people who come and present to us at the same time. So we're all hearing the same information from uh, a company, from a nonprofit, from a foundation. Um, uh, but it certainly, I would say a regular part of my job is having conversations with people who have a completely different fact basis for the topic we're discussing. Um, and obviously uh, as the chairwoman on a committee that's looking at domestic terrorism, this is a huge, huge issue. And we've talked about this, Stephen. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, I think the thing that I have challenged myself to do is how do you have a conversation with someone when you don't agree on facts without just walking away, throwing up your hands and saying, that's it. Um, and this is, this is a, it's difficult, right? Because convincing someone that their facts are wrong is one of the hardest things to do in, I don't know, human interaction. Um, but we cannot give up on people. We cannot just say, well, that's their America and this is my America. We're gonna have different facts and that's it. The media has certain responsibilities. Social media has certain responsibilities. I'll be honest with you, you know, all of us have probably seen intentional disinformation or misinformation come across our Facebook feeds, our social media feeds. You know it, you know, you get a sense of when you see it. Has any one of us ever mistakenly seen child pornography as we're scrolling? No, because it's illegal for the social media companies to allow the spread of child pornography. Um, I think one of the things that um, I feel strongly about is that Social media has come a long way in 20 years, and we haven't really done our jobs in Congress to properly oversee and put some rules of the road in place. Um, but uh, to me, that's some of the, the hardest work that we have to do. But the most important is talking to people who just have been educated. And I'm talking about like my in-laws. I'm talking about my neighbors, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm getting practiced in having the conversation, but it's very difficult. We had a hearing, Fred and I, uh, the Energy and Commerce Committee just had Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Google in front of the committee. And I actually will tell you, it's the first time I've seen the committee united on both sides in uh, uh, holding them accountable for the disinformation. And the fact of the matter is, is that their revenue models is such that the more clicks they get, the more money they make. And while they claim uh, that they're cleaning up their act, the fact of the matter is that they're not. I think you will, as Alyssa said, uh, see both Energy and Commerce and the Judiciary Committee, Energy and Commerce sh should have the lead on this. Uh, Fred, I think you would agree that we will take, it'll be tough. It's, you know, this is when you gotta really sit down and do the nitty gritty and find where we can unite on this. But we have to do something about this because people are believing what they are reading. Uh, on these social media platforms. Facebook 
was the most common uh, pl platform mentioned after the January 6 uh, insurrection. Uh, Facebook was where the group that was going to kidnap the governor uh, did most of their communications. Uh, all of us here uh, that you're talking to today have had a number of threats and uh, we it's a different day and age and it's not okay so uh, they are contributing to it it we have to figure out how we address the problem and unfortunately the genie's out of the bottle on a lot of this stuff we got a I, lot of questions we got a lot of questions from our audience on uh, the idea of franchising the problem solvers cauc caucus to the Senate is there a like minded group in the Senate, or is there a possibility that there will, that one will be created? Actually, there is. Um, it's called No Labels, mm. uh, and it's bicameral, and it, so it's not just, I'd say there's probably a, a bunch of Senate, you know, that's viewed as more collegial, so they're all, they all have their hideaway, they're all, you know, they have lunch together every day, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but then there's a bicameral group uh, that's bipartisan, and we meet actually once a month, and, and it's called No Labels. Actually, Governor Hogan from Maryland is actually hosting an, an event on immigration a little bit later this this month. Uh, they put out an invite to a number of us to join them. Those the day that we don't have votes. Uh, so uh, and there's so there's a lot of you know we, we talked about immigration. Uh, we were involved with them on the COVID package. Uh, had a number of meetings. Uh, together, where we really in, in, uh, uh, embraced some trust. And you got to remember, there's a, a lot of the senators actually came from the House. Uh, so, you know, Roy Blunt, I used to sit next to him when he was at Energy and Commerce. Uh, you know, Portman, I mean, you got a lot of folks that are over there. So it's happening, uh, but our lives are pretty complicated, and we wish that there was more time in the day to try and do something. And I would also say to you, Fred, there is a group of Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, uh, Joe Manchin, um, and, and then other senators come in and out of the group that do try to find uh, common are, ground in different Those pieces. members are part of no labels as well. Yeah. So, so we had a couple questions also about uh, President Biden and his agenda, uh, which you know, he campaigned on the idea of unity and bringing the country together, but certainly in the early uh, in the early going, the things that he's sending over to Congress to, to vote on are coming out, coming back uh, along really bitter partisan um, divides. Uh, I, I wonder what the Problem Solvers Caucus makes of you know this early this early period and the opportunity to, to get more Republican support, or at least uh, you know, shape the bills in a way uh, that would get more bipartisan support than we've seen so far. Well, I reminded the White House of that very uh, issue just yesterday. So <laughs> I can read you my email, but I won't. Uh, but I would, uh, and we'll, we'll see how it, how it develops. But you know, we all want the president to succeed. Uh, this is a great country. We have to work together. We got a lot of issues that we have to really deal with. And the best way to deal with them is in a bipartisan basis. And uh, you're right, the last COVID package uh, was a purely partisan vote. Uh, let's hope that they turn the page on that chapter and we can really resort uh, to some true bipartisanship from both the House and the Senate. Uh, infrastructure is a, a big need, certainly for us in Michigan. Remember the governors saying, fix the damn roads. Uh, they're not fixed yet. Uh, they need to be fixed. We got a lot of issues we have to deal with, whether it's the resilience of, of our grid. We saw what happened in Texas, what always happens in California, uh, our lead in our water, uh, the great, I mean, there's a lot of different issues, uh, broadband that we can work on together. And frankly, would send a pretty good message to the rest of the country if in fact uh, we get this thing done in a bipartisan way. So we'll see where it takes us. Uh, the White House. Today. Ask, I, I, I don't know, maybe Alyssa's been to the White House. I haven't been to the White House, but somebody I know has been down there. There. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I, they're, I think they're, uh, so I don't know that any of the Democrats in our delegations, the senators may, but the House have been there, but they're reaching out to the Republicans and they're trying. Alyssa may have been. 
Yeah, I, I, I would just say, I think my approach on this is get caught trying, right? Do everything you can to make something bipartisan because the country needs to see that because that's what they want from their leaders, right? But if you try and you try and you try and you can't compromise, well, then I understand the instinct to go ahead and move out. Um, and I think that that is to me where I probably have a slight difference with the administration on approach is get caught trying. Let's let's open the door. Um, and if they don't walk through it, OK, then we move on our own. And I think that um, uh, it would have been my hope that we would have approached COVID that way. We said that as a problem solvers caucus, many of us put out. Um, clear statements, both publicly, but also privately to our, our colleagues in the new White House. Um, and, um, you know, again, in the spirit of not just hitting home runs, you know, it's great if we pass these two massive bills and then what? That's the only legislation we're going to actually pass into law in the next two years. I reject that. You know, we need to actually be getting to that right now, that 60 vote majority in the Senate. We need to be putting up bills that meet that. There's a ton of bipartisan bills from the House that are ready to be voted on by the Senate. I'll never understand why they just don't do a damn up or down vote um, and put people on record on these things. Like let them vote against a veterans bill, right? Go ahead if you're gonna do that. Um, so I, I think it, some of us may have a slightly different approach get caught trying on bipartisanship. Well, I would actually argue that they did try. I know they tried. They talked to Republicans. Fred knows they talked to Republicans. Um, this was one of those times where, and th Fred would have voted for some of these bills except for some provisions in them and communicated it. I would actually argue that the White House, they're not talking to me, or I mean, they're talking, but they're talking to Republicans. And I know they're talking to Republicans and they very much are focused on this on the infrastructure bill, whether it works or not. But you have to remember that to pass a bill, you gotta go through the House, the Senate before it gets to the White House and there's leadership in there along the way. But I know that there's nobody, I've known Joe Biden for 40 years and I know he is committed. I know what the staff has done. That's how I know that they talk to Fred more than they talk to me because they tell me they talk to him. I don't know how much they talk to him. Alyssa, but I know that they are very intentional about trying to get Republican votes. They're not getting there uh, and we'll see. I know that there are people in the White House that suggested that there should be a bill that has bipartisan agreement and the rest of things should be in a different bill. I hope I'm not making and others in the Congress did not want it to go that way, but there have been very serious. I have to feel, I, I do feel like I have to defend this administration that the president himself is trying to work with Republicans. Well, we have time for final remarks from each of you, final thoughts on what it's gonna to take to make consensus governing the norm in Washington and in places like Lansing and perhaps even in our local communities. What's it gonna to take to get back to that idea that compromise is a positive thing and not a negative thing? Yes, we have no choice. We have no choice. If you want to get things done, you got to work together. And uh, that's why I'm absolutely committed. That's why uh, Debbie and Alyssa are on the same page, Peter Meyer. Uh, we're, we're all together on this. And, you know, we're not here to, to swing at windmills. We're here to try and govern and, and to do what's right for the country. Congress's meaning is a coming together. Uh, Compromise isn't a dirty word, and we need to try to do that more. And I would just say, as a national security person, I really feel like, you know, unlike the last 20 years where the greatest threat I really felt to national security was the external threats, right? The foreign terrorist organizations that were seeking to attack us from abroad. I really think that the divisiveness between Americans is the greatest national security threat, certainly because some people decide to like escalate and become extreme and terrorists. Um, but honestly, because it creates gridlock in governing and it makes people lose faith in democracy, that is a threat to us. And so I guess, you know, obviously in our own elected lives, um, we are all responsible for our own actions and our own decisions. Um, we've decided to, to think about what our roles mean for unifying the country. And until elected leaders realize that their job is to unify and not to split us apart, we're gonna have a real problem. Um, 
And we're committed to working against that. Well, we appreciate you all for your, thank you for your time today. Thank you for what you're doing in Congress uh, to make this a more functional uh, society, more, a more uh, pleasant place to live. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be with you.